We will start. Welcome. Welcome. Religious Liberties for Corporations, 
Hobby Lobby, the Affordable Care Act, and the Constitution. And uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Ilya Shapiro, who will introduce tonight's discussion. Ilya, welcome. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, attending these events, so I was tickled when Ron called me and asked whether I'd be willing to moderate and you know, get credit for being on the stage, as it were, without really having to put in much hard work of providing the main substance, uh, as the, the, the panelists are here, who I'll introduce now. Uh, Danielle Citron is the Lewis K. Mock Research Professor and Professor of Law at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Her work focuses on information privacy, cyber law, automated systems, and civil rights. In 2005, she received the Teacher of the Year Award. Professor Citron is also an affiliate fellow of the Yale Information Society Project, an affiliate scholar of the Stanford Center on Internet Society, an advisor to California Attorney General Kamala Harris's Task Force Against Cyber Exploitation, and the American Law Institute's Restatement Third of Information Privacy Principles Project. I wouldn't realize that there are already three restatements of information privacy principles. That's no, the first one ever, but we're under the hub. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So we have to go in there, but we've never done it before. Um, and she has many more accolades. The most interesting uh, that jumped out at me in her bio uh, is that uh, uh, this book that we're talking about today, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, <laughs> Don't you love it, Danielle? <laughs> was nominated in 2014 by Cosmo and Harper's Bazaar as one of the top 20 best moments for women in 2014. <coughs> there you go. Um, discussing uh, Professor Citron's book will be Laura Hanman, who's a co chair of the uh, Davis Wright Tremaine's appellate practice and divide your time between the New York and D.C. offices. Glad that you're here. No offense to all of you in New York. Um, for 30 years, Laura has been providing pre-publication counseling and litigation services to broadcasters, film studios, and book, magazine, newspaper, and internet publishers and nonprofits. Basically a, a dream job for anyone, you know, a law student who says that they're really into uh, publishing and First Amendment and I want to deal with media companies. This is it. You want to get to know her. Uh, and and find out uh, her secrets to get to how she's been. I mean, her list of clients is just incredible. Uh, I'll just uh, randomly, Amazon.com, Atlantic Media Company, Bloomberg, China Central Television, Dow Jones, Random House, Yale Alumni Magazine. Well, as a Princeton man, I'll forgive you that. <laughs> and Yelp. Anyway, um, those are our discussions. Uh, Danielle, can you start just by, um, I, I will say this book, uh, I don't know if, if, if Ron knew this when he asked me, but there are very few subjects uh, on which I have no preconceived opinions about. Uh, this is one of them. I, 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 when I got this book, I was like, hmm, I've heard of, you know, I know revenge porn is out there. I know stalking, cyber stalking. No idea what the laws on any of this stuff is. Uh, no idea what problems might be, what reform efforts might be. I could, you know, hypothesize First Amendment issues like a, a law school exam or something. But anyway, I'm, I'm very glad to be educated uh, uh, by your book, Danielle. So why don't you start this by... Uh, talking about what motivated you to write it and the main uh, themes that you're trying to get across or, or put into the, the public discussion. So I started working on the question of cyber harassment and cyber stalking in 2007. There were some sort of big high profile attacks on um, Kathy Sierra, I don't know if anyone knows who she's a tech blogger at the time. Um, and she was targeted on, on her blog and a number of group blogs and a graphic threats of violence comments on her blog, doctors photographs of her that look like she's being strangled <coughs> with lingerie. There are photos of her that were doctors that had um, a comment like um, with a noose, that was an actual noose appeared next to her picture. So the only doctors who heard her next eye, um, her, she talks about, she samples um, a speaking engagement in San Francisco and, and she writes about it on her blog. And as soon as she writes about it, there is a campaign, sort of a second campaign of abuse that um, her social security number, home address, sort of a, a story of defamation about her mother, accusing her of being a prostitute and a bankrupt stage, of having affairs and sex of surgery all over the internet. And, and the reason as uh, individuals who were spreading the story about her and her involved with her social security number and information was that she was whining about being targeted with rape threats, death threats, uh, um, the doctor's photograph. So how dare she? why about being explicitly threatened so graphically that she had to be taught not to whine anymore. And the, so much of the kind of story about this attack on Kathy Sierra was that if the Wild West folks get over yourself, like Kathy 
just stop making such a fuss of this. Ignore it. You know, she was told to turn her computer off. And so, um, you know, I write about. I don't know what this time, just the microphone a little closer to you so that you can hear. Oh, more. sure. Are you having any issues hearing in yeah, your exactly. yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, is it, is it here? Thank you for asking. We'll move, we'll move this. So we'll do two things. We'll move this a little closer and ask you to make it smooth. Great. No wonder the class is my hilarious introduction. <laughs> is that uh, Daniel? Let's do is that. that better? Okay. Daniel? Right. So Celia asked me so what motivated me, what started me on this journey, and then um, so I was talking about how in 2007. Um, there were some prominent attacks on women, both in the tech blogosphere as well as law students on various message boards, and, and the attacks were often brutal. We had, um, there were rape and death threats, really graphic rape and death threats. Often the abuse was accompanied by defamation, so accusations that someone had a sexually transmitted disease or that they were interested in anonymous sex and their home address and various personal information would be provided. Um, privacy invasions would often accompany the stalking and harassment, so nude photos or doctor's photographs that make it look like someone was nude and was interested and available for anonymous death. And sometimes the abuse was accompanied by sort of technical attacks, so distributed denial of service attacks designed to shove people in silence and push them offline, um, false reports of abuse in the attempt to have <coughs> providers you know, turn off people's profiles. And at the time, so this is 2007, 2008, the response was often by law enforcement to victims when they went to law enforcement was just boys will be boys. It's no big deal. Um, just ignore it. It will go away. Um, and, and this happened, kept happening more and more um, victims were told a sort of very similar pattern, a sort of perfect storm of abuse often sort of death threats, <clears throat> privacy invasions, defamation, often technical attacks. And it was like a, an endless loop that victims sort of got in touch with various of us who were involved in privacy and academia. And the response so often was, just ignore it, it'll go away. When in fact, of course, for victims, it can't go away. When a Google search of your name prominently advises <laughs> that to the suggestion that you're interested and available for sex on like adult finder sites, your new sort of doctor photos, and you can't walk away from it, right? Employers aren't walking away from it, right? And individuals are losing, losing, you know, tangible life opportunities. You don't need to work to engage online. Kathy Sierra, I talked about her earlier, so folks who didn't hear, but people shut down their blogs. They were shoved offline with technical attacks, but they kind of retreated, right? Because the more they stayed online, the more it was sort of provocative, right? And the more they retreated, the attacks would sort of subside. Um, and as I started writing about it, I sort of, I understood all of this because so often the victims were, were women um, and the attacks so gendered and sexually humiliating and so men experienced stalking and harassment as well, it often lines up in the same way. So it's not just threats, it's threats of anal rape, right? It's not just any old lie but the suggestion someone has AIDS, HIV, herpes, right, uh, is a prostitute. And the privacy invasions were often very sexual, but it's new photos, right? And the suggestion that someone was available for sex. Um, and I understood all of this like, as kind of the new frontier of, 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 you know, interferences with our civil rights, right? That it's so often we've been talking about fundamental civil liberties, but we were sort of neglecting, I think, an important story about how we were using network tools not as liberty enhancing ways but in ways to deprive people of their liberty, right? Their ability to live free from harm, to work, to get jobs, to engage as, you know, as journalists and make a living online, right? In all the ways that we need to. So that's what the, the sort of trivialization of online abuse is what sort of launched me into this project. Um, and the, the, the hope in this book was to, I think, really carefully um, carve out an understanding that law can do something here. That is, we don't have to write a whole new school of laws. We, so often I talk about this, people say, oh, we've got we've to gotta pass all these new laws. And, we, and that's not true. We have laws on the books that we can deploy um, to combat much of stalking, harassment, threats. Um, we, 
and some civil rights act violations. So there's reform we need to engage in, of course. But I think an important part of this story is that law enforcement to teach them um, that there are laws we can use right now. We don't have to completely rewrite the you know, state <coughs> statutes and the U.S. codes. Um, we've got to be educated about them. And I wanted to, as best that I could, uh, and in the most nuanced way that I could, um, create an agenda that would comport with First Amendment doctrine and, and First Amendment theory. That is, I'm modest in my sort of demands of the law because I consider myself a civil libertarian, though you know, I have friends at the ACLU and EFF, I feel like I'm one of you. Um, I promise, right, <laughs> that, um, you know, when I first started talking about all of this work, people would say, like, well, you kind of break the internet, Danielle, you know, and I really wasn't. I tried to be as careful as I can be. Um, and in the last year and a half, I've been working with A.B. Harris in California to educate law enforcement. Um, I've been working with companies since 2009 to, to think hard about their uh, terms of service and community guidelines and to urge them to be as careful as possible <coughs> about what they mean by terms like harassment and stalking. And to, you know, if they're going to remove speech, to let their users know and give them a chance to um, object and provide modes of redress um, because platforms are so powerful. So the book is sort of tackle law and what law can do um, within the confines of the First Amendment and what companies are doing and what they should be doing better um, to ensure that uh, you know, they're still indispensable platforms to our communication. So that's the, the hope of the book. Just so we're on the same page, and before we get to uh, reform proposals or new laws, uh, talk about existing law and, and what, you know, because part of it, there, there seems to be a theme throughout the book that the police just didn't know, or, you know, the one one officer just had never heard of Twitter, for example, and that was <laughs> two years ago, not like right now, but, uh, Not that long ago, 2012, okay. and now the Hesses. Uh, and uh, just didn't, didn't think that anything, you know, online was even applicable in his jurisdiction, in his bailiwick, as, as it were. Uh, but here, lo and behold, there's the, the federal stalking and harassment law, which you say captures a wide range of online abuse. So talk about this existing law. Well, not the federal one, but, you know, whatever the kind of general state mode is as well. Right. So, um, and, and a lot of my sort of suggestions are geared at the state. They're the sort of, the beginnings of stalking and harassment law came from the state. So in 1990, California passes the first stalking and harassment law. Within three years, every state follows. Um, they are... I mean, you know that federal resources are incredibly limited. Whenever anyone goes to federal law enforcement, the response is, it's not national security. We have no help for you. And, and it's understandable, right? In a world of limited resources, California has 20,000 peace officers or police officers vis-a-vis -vis what the FBI's resources are available. Um, but so we have stalking, in about half the state, there are stalking and harassment laws that address um, a, the targeting of a specific person with a harassment, a course of conduct, which has a distinct meaning in the law, with an intent to harass or intimidate um, that does in fact cause severe emotional distress and or the fear of physical harm. Um, and these laws have been, so we have to say they're pretty well-designed laws that as applied have been upheld, you, usually in cases in which you have this perfect storm of largely unprotected speech, so true threats, defamation, um, the publication of social security numbers or what we're calling revenge porn, but really the non-consensual distribution of, of new photographs of, of individual private <coughs> right? So not Hulk Hogan, right? Just the ordinary person. <laughs> I just say that. We'll get to him and we'll get there, right? and all that. Right. Uh, but you have <laughs> ordinary person, right? And so we do have laws we could deploy, but so often they're just left on the books. They're underutilized. It's true that about half the states we have laws that are really, they're, so, they're, they're drawn to address, they're called email harassment laws, or telephone harassment laws. They don't capture abuse that, so for example, <coughs> from New York, um, they only cover direct communication, so one-to-one -one communication, victim, defendant. And so case from New York, uh, just a, a boyfriend posts, uh, there's a breakup, um, defendant posts a, a nude photograph of an ex-girlfriend that was shared in confidence and with an expectation of privacy. On Twitter, he sent them to her employer, to all of her, she's a, I think she was a drug rep, so all to her, her clients, um, and to her family members, and, and other kind of, and then to 
and the threats <clears> as well. And and some of it, it, most of it's on like sort of public pages, so that it's not sent directly to her. Um, she's indicted, but it's dismissed, and rightly so, because the New York law only covers one-to-one -one communications between the defendant and the victim. We've got to catch these laws up. They shouldn't be technologically either bound to email, which we don't do it anymore, but even if we did, they just aren't capacious enough. So we've got some work to do at the state level. Um, and we've got threat laws on the book, many with intent requirements, <laughs> right, post Alana. We have sort of laws that have been upheld, uh, threat laws on the book. So we, we have extortion solicitation so often. You know, people will impersonate individuals on adult finder sites or on sort of porn sites and suggest that those sort of false ads and suggest someone is interested in rape fantasies and provide all of their home, you know, their home address, when they will be home, you know, their contact information. And we can understand that as a form of solicitation. So there are criminal laws that we can bring to bear now against these views. Um, and we have the federal cyber stalking law, 18 U.S.C. 23. 51A, which you know, it sort of could be a template for other states. It's very well designed, crafted. Um, it, it covers, uh, you know, the targeting of an individual with a harassing course of conduct, with strong intent requirements, and um, proof of fear of physical harm and the, or substantial emotional distress. And, and they've been a the prosecution under 2851 and it's in the past. Or. Do you see, uh, how do you see these problems that Danielle has identified, and, and what do you think about uh, the laws that she's discussed? Well, I'm going to start with uh, my own story. Um, as some of my colleagues know, I have been a victim of cyberbullying. Uh, and so I come at this with a less doctrinaire view than you might think from uh, the bio that Ilya And uh, it began, uh, I was representing a newspaper, a lawyer representing a client who didn't like the newspaper's coverage complained. I responded, uh, and that then led me to be the subject of attack uh, on the client's website. Uh, everything from my curly hair to my credentials to my husband. Uh, and uh, most offensive of all, putting comments in my name uh, on his comments page, comments that I never made. I'm being deliberately vague because I don't want to invite his attention. Um, and uh, I am engaged in the kind of self-censorship that Danielle describes in her book that is a result of cyberbullying. Uh, and in the course of the work uh, of which there were multiple times when the lawyer contacted me about coverage, and I made sure that the associate's name was nowhere to be found in any of the communications because, as you say, this has much more of an impact on someone beginning their career than someone whose career is already established. Um, I asked the lawyer to ask his client to take this down. Uh, the result was worse, and he said, I have no control. And I said to the lawyer, then you need to look to your own conscience, and ultimately he was replaced, and new lawyers took his place, of course. Um, I did think about libel suits, as some of my colleagues know, uh, and of course I know better than anyone how difficult a plaintiff's libel suit is, and how very awkward it would be for someone like me to bring one. Um, I did think about false impersonation, which he gave, engaged in by using my putting comments in my name. Uh, but no one, I knew that no one who knew me or knew of me would ever think I would have made those comments. And indeed, I've never posted a comment in my life anywhere. Uh, uh, I, I am not in the uh, social media world for good reason. Uh, he did use my picture from the firm website. And I thought about a copyright claim. Uh, but he did write over my picture things like racist and guilty of being ugly. So arguably it was a transformative view. <laughs> 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 uh, he did put a famous celebrity um, uh, in a very seductive uh, picture next to me in order to, of course, attract clicks because people are not looking for me, they're looking for the celebrity. Um, but uh, getting Google or anybody to sort of not be so 
susceptible to those kinds of tricks is, is pretty uh, useless. So you say, well, what are the remedies? And I don't think the remedy is to uh, expand criminalization of speech. Um, and the Alonis case, I think, pulled, was a good example of where someone, a rapper, uh, posted rap lyrics that were very violent. Um, he wasn't a one-to-one -one communication. It was a one-to-many, as Professor Balko uh, described. Uh, and the Supreme Court said it's not enough that a reasonable person would view this as a threat to them. Uh, he has to have intended to threaten uh, his soon-to-be ex-wife. Um, and I had some first-hand experience with this, representing a small-town paper, which very much functioned, their, their website and blog functioned function very much as a virtual town square. And there was a great controversy at the time about the school superintendent who ultimately resigned. And lo and behold, the small town newspaper got a grand jury subpoena wanting the IP address of someone who posted on the blog uh, some pretty obnoxious comments, including uh, as posted anonymously that the superintendent should be worried <coughs> when she was stopped at a traffic light. Um, and the judge in Goshen, New York, not a place you would think would be a hotbed of First Amendment uh, thinking, uh, said, ask the prosecutor, so is the grand jury investigation based on speech and speech alone? Is there evidence of any crime? If you saw evidence, I didn't see it. And then he said, assuming you can translate the post from the moron who wrote it, it's still only speech. <laughs> and he quashed the subpoena did not require us to reveal the IP address, which in a small town where you're writing about a superintendent and there could be retaliation, be it if you're a parent or a teacher or a student, uh, the anonymity actually does matter. But the judge said as the publisher who was there was leaving, uh, you got to police that blog. And that honestly is the remedy and that I think is what you're saying, um, that part of the First Amendment exercise of speech is the right to decide what you want on your blog. And uh, I think it, that is the example of where, you know, she could think about, well, maybe I don't want that offensive comment on my small town paper blog and the terms and conditions that you were mentioning. And I saw when Microsoft recently said they've taken down 67% of the revenge porn requests that they've asked for takedown. And then they look at the others and they say, well, there's not really nudity, or well, the victim's not really identifiable, or um, we don't know enough about the sort of background. Uh, but they take the time to make those uh, d decisions. Um, I also don't think, uh, and, and Danielle talked about this a little bit, cutting back on the Section 230 protection for websites for third-party content is the solution. We want to encourage the websites to curate, to take down, to move to the bottom of the pile <laughs> those uh, comments that they think are less worthy without jeopardizing the protection that they've been given. Uh, the trade-off might be that you know if a, uh, someone could show that there was a prima facie case of libel, then in exchange for having that protection, if you're the website, maybe you decide to reveal the poster um, so that there is a remedy uh, by the person who's defamed. Uh, or you do what TripAdvisor does. Um, obviously, their model Also is, one of her clients. <laughs> their model is crowdsourcing. So you get to see there's you know the raft of comments and you can evaluate what you, you think is, uh, you know, uh, rings true, and also they give you actually information about the reviewers. Uh, you can see, well, this person gave negative reviews to every place he went. I'm not going to really credit what he said about the dirtiest hotel. Um, uh, so I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, those are the solutions. I think the, if you think about the dirty website, it uh, poses a lot of these questions. The dirty got a post of Anthony Weiner's sexting from uh, the woman who received the post. Was that newsworthy? Yes. Did it lead to his uh, resignation from Congress? Yes. Did it violate his privacy? In my judgment, no. Um, 
Um, uh, a closer question, Gregory, was the uh, Kylie and kinds of comments about the Cincinnati Bengal cheerleader turned school teacher. But there again, the Sixth Circuit said that the uh, uh, editor of that site did not materially contribute to the defamatory content, even though he said he added his own comment, why are all high school teachers freaks and bets? That was not an adoption of the comment. It didn't alter the comment materially contribute. So I think the bottom line is the line drawing is excruciatingly difficult. But it should not be, in my view, most often as a point of an indictment or as a threat of liability. And Danielle, um, Laura says that part of what you may be doing is uh, criminalizing speech. Um, it, are you calling for criminalizing some sort of speech, or is it all fitting this, this bad stuff into the different categories like defamation or solicitation of uh, criminal activity or uh, uh, disclosing uh, the, the, the non consensual porn? Is that some sort of new category? Is that some sort of fraudulent, uh, without consent sort of uh, thing? So, talk to us about you and all that. Okay. I think my report is designed to only address speech that falls within either existing categories or speech that historically has been provided less rigorous protection. So let's take the example of revenge porn tonight, um, criminalizing the non-consensual publication of new images, um, knowing that the person um, share them in confidence or with an expectation or reasonable expectation of privacy, um, with an important connection for matters of touching on matters of public importance. Um, I think we, with the Barton case, one of my favorite cases um, that I think will definitely be right? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for all that. Would you repeat that for the New York audience? Yeah, it's lovely in Barton McGee versus Bonker. I am very uh, humbled to be here with all of you, too. Um, but, you know, Bart makes a lot of that, that um, and I realize it's different, but when it comes to uh, certainly the publication of truthful information about purely, about, sorry, about matters related to the public interest, we can't punish that speech, right? But when it comes to the purely private matters, and the court talks about in DECA, domestic gossip, right? That, that we have privacy protections in the Wiretap Act. Um, it's largely we don't have electronic communication. Why? Because it fosters private speech. The court underscored that we have speech on both interests on both sides of the equation, right? The, um, the punishment of or or remedy for the disclosure of private facts related to purely private matters. That, of course, is dependent on free speech, right? But at the same time, you have free speech interests um, that are on, that is, individuals who are communicating privately are not going to communicate if they think all of their communications, electronic communications, or wire communications, are going to be for public speech. The court recognizes that there's speech on both sides of the coin, right? Um, revenge porn statutes or the criminalization of um, the non consensual, the disclosure of non consensual pornography um, is the kind of speech that is um, it's private communication, but if they didn't have these protections, right, people aren't going to share them with each other. There's no sense of confidentiality or privacy. I mean, I'm, this is what happens when you're 47 years old, but I'm not sharing any photos with my spouse, right? <laughs> but I, I have high schoolers who I say you can't do it unless you're over 18 and it's child pornography, but, but assuming after they turn 18, right, which is soon enough, right, they can do that. It's a form of intimate expression, and I hope that if they do it, they have conversations about confidentiality and privacy. And that if they do, they would have form of expression. And how do you define the private information? Like how does the statute define it? Or how well, how does, it, sure, how does the statute define it, or how would you define it? Because what 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 counts as personal, private, or so intimate that the sharing of that is uh, is or should be? Because so, um, I can share lots of embarrassing things that aren't no, you know, sure. sexual or domestic. Or oh, absolutely. And we've got to be really clear about the kinds of images we're talking about. So not that the embarrassing images, not offensive images, but naked images. I'm going to take some of them where I'm going to go. Yeah, 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 I'm going to go
you see it's dog eared and underlined, I've read it. I know, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right? But I mean, what's the, I think we can define nudity as being something that is not clarity and we do elsewhere, right? Video blur is right? There are we have and have that as So it's just that sort of thing. What if it's you know, what if I'm having beers with Ron right. and well no, I would never do this. What if my wife were having beers with Ron and starts complaining about me? Right? right. That would be embarrassing if Ron publicized that on the next uh, issue of First Amendment News. Sure, it's embarrassing but totally protected speech, even though well you're not both your private individuals or the private public figure.
clear that um, I, I think I would have a very broad definition of what to mean for the I'm not sure it would agree with your um, and I mean one interesting yeah. thing too is so Eugene Volek has um, had public discussions that also talked to me about how he understands non conceptual pornography as offending. That if the framework would certainly understand that those are seen, that it's been that the non consensual piece of this movie is, is what for him turns it into obscenity. I kind of resist obscenity just as a category it's so smushy as it is. And community standards. That's one definable thing. If you right. that, that's, that's an actual right. definable no, type of charity. That's true. And, and I guess the, the reason why I, I think of this as privacy and it, that the kind of piece that because it is so sensitive and so sacred a sexuality that it is especially deserving of privacy because otherwise without it we're not going to communicate. It reminds me of an RAV where the court talks about threats against the president. It's an especially troubling kind of threat. So it seems like it's content discrimination, but if it's for the reason it's prescribable, we can it. So I, you know, I talk about it, but I don't hang my hat on it. Well, I want to open this to questions soon, I think. Um, but I want to have one more round uh, regarding what I just mentioned, Danielle, right before we started, uh, which is a development that's happened since her book was sent to the uh, to the publishers, and that's the uh, the right to be forgotten that's now been recognized uh, in the European Union. Uh, is that, uh, you know, could something like that ever fly under American law? But even leaving that aside, is that a good construct for dealing with these issues? Right. So the the right to be forgotten, of course, the, the European Court of Justice um, instructs Google uh, that they need to be sort of the arbiters of, of speech that should be that it's it's not really newsworthy anymore. It's um, you know in that case it was a news of a bankruptcy that was kind of old. The person or it was a debt that wasn't paid that then was paid, and so it was old news at that point. Um, and the search engine was instructed by the European Court of Justice to de-index um, the news article in a search of the individual case. So your question was, would this right to be forgotten fly under First Amendment doctrine? The answer is no way, no how, right? I mean, for all the reasons we were just having a spirited conversation about <coughs> facts, uh, generally are pro protected speech unless it falls within a category or a, a set of uh, you know, a start, an understood area which there's historically recognized as, as enjoying less protection. So, but we have seen a sort of, we've seen a modified version of the right to be forgotten in some sense in FICRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, in which, you know, we say, look, we're going to keep out of credit reports that, you know, uh, bankruptcies that are over 10 years old. So the idea is in credit isn't totally um, I think it's ill, Ill advised to put in the job of arbiters of search engines or private companies, and rather there be like a formal. Well, you, you proposed a fair reputation reporting act. Well, it's something that's yeah. right? That is, um, it may be that. So, when I think about right the following idea, it's in the context of private companies making decisions on their own voluntarily without order of a court, like the European Court of Justice, uh, and whether there should be some mode of due process, right, which is voluntarily internalized, right? Companies deciding as Microsoft did, I think, in a really progressive way, but providing lots of transparency. You know, Jacqueline Desher and Steve Stacey also your call, right? Do you want to say that Microsoft is another terrific client? Of Laura's, um, making clear how many requests I got. So I think it was like 500 requests, yeah. and they took down what was it, 57% of them. Um, they are making clear to the public, look, we're not having a rash of unfounded requests. It's not thousands and thousands, right? It's affecting an acute number of people, uh, and we're making thoughtful decisions, and we're being transparent about it, about how we define non-commercial pornography. Microsoft's been very clear. And what they're doing about it. And I think that's the right way to go about it. It's, but it's a private version. It's not a sort of federal, you know, fair reputation act in that way. It's private companies making, I think, decisions to be good Samaritans in a very clear and transparent way, which I applaud. Yeah. And which ultimately, hopefully, affects their brand and people saying this is a thoughtful company. I do want my phone to be with them, I do want my email to be with them. It's Microsoft. I do want to read this blog because it, it actually is curated and it doesn't have trash. Um, and so hopefully, ultimately, you'll be 
rewarded for being a good citizen. And uh, that would be the model that I would strive for. And we, you know, in advising newspapers, there are decisions sometimes made where you decide to key index stories, whether it's to protect a confidential source if it's a threatened claim, or because the person was extremely young and foolish, and uh, you decide you want to. But that's an editorial decision not dictated by a court. And is that why private companies generally have um, and I try to keep uh, up to date their terms of service uh, because the marketplace will discipline them. Otherwise, they'll be seen as a disreputable brand or, or in, uh, uh, facilitating bad stuff. I think so, but of course, you know, there's a huge array. Not everybody. Might have that problem. And the right. other point is, you know, the Googles and the Microsofts of the world can afford to have people making these thoughtful decisions. You know, I mean, Google wants the right to be forgotten. They have a whole army of people reviewing the stuff now. Most, most folks don't have those resources. So, uh, that's, you know, another problem I think you're basically forcing large companies can do this kind of thoughtful work, but not necessarily smaller entities. Speaking of uh, Eugene Bollock, uh, the Bullock conspiracy, I think each one of the individual bloggers gets all signed on their comment policy and a whole range of individual policies. Now, some have curated comments, some just disclose, I don't curate at all, but open comments have at it. Some say I'll have no comments whatsoever. Some do kind of a hybrid where they'll open it, but if there's too much that they don't have time for, they'll just close it at that point. What do you think about something like that? How would you would, would you advise that that's not a good thing, or let the, it's on an individual level, to do whatever is right, but the uh, law conspiracy as a whole might have to take a different tack, or the Washington Post channel. I mean, I think it, it you know you have to look at who's coming to that site. I mean, you're not going to get revenge porn probably on. I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea. Um, I have to ask. I mean, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, so, there are there are female bloggers on. on and I think there are a lot of, um, you know, websites that have decided that they don't want anonymous posters. Um, and, you know, there is a place for anonymous speech, um, and certainly it's protected. Um, and as I said with my little school superintendent situation, that, that would be a reason for anonymous for speech where you're commenting on, you know, community development. Do I think that you probably get more responsible comments if you don't allow anonymous speech? Yes. Do I think it's easy to evade? Yes. Uh, so how useful it is, I'm not sure. Sure. Right. When, when, when you're going to SCOTUS blog, live blog, which is probably the only one that I comment on or whatever, when they ask some, <laughs> right. some big questions, right? Sometimes they just ask you to sign in with just your name. So most often I put in my name, but sometimes I just, you know, to make a private joke to Tom or Amy or something, I'll just lie along, I'll just put in something else. And so I guess that's getting around me. You know, I still have my name, but it's not my name. All right, questions from the audience, either here or in New York. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have a question about whether you were a extension oh. <laughs> of the heckler veto in this scenario, and particularly with regard to private employees, uh, private I'll, I'll repeat the question if you can't hear it. They private can't companies. Can they hear me at all? We can hear you. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Private yeah. companies establishing terms of service whereby they are taking down common seems offensive. Because what I've seen in the real world now is that there is a careful evaluation of the complaint. And instead, the speaker's comments get taken down. They can be barred from uh, posting again or speaking again on that site without really any due process at all. And so what's interesting about, when we think about the hacker's veto, um, when you have, um, with private companies, you know, they, we had this immunity for them because we wanted to encourage them. This is the rationale behind the 1996, right? The Decency Act, which always makes me laugh. It's called the Decency Act, right? But it was like meant to get porn off the internet, which is like a joke, right? Um, but what remains, of course, is too Because as we know from Avenue Q, the internet is porn. Yeah, of course, right? Um, but you know, so the idea was to give them this good Samaritan treatment, whether they do nothing or are aggressively curating. 
Um, and so, so we allow them to, of course, I guess that heck you know, on TV is striking is like where we have government intervention and so we're going to have an over chilling of speech where it's private companies, I'm just having a sort of dissonance moment, right? When I was about it. We don't have government intervention because we've got this immunity, right? And so you have sites like the sites, Laura, you were talking about from your own experience or the dirty.com which say, We've got Section 230, too bad, so sad. And I don't care if it's defamation or if it's revenge porn. You have sites that are devoted to revenge porn. And their operators are gleeful about Section 230. They say, look, you, you know, we encourage access to post new photos, right? And nothing can be done about it. Sue me, go try. And, you know, you can't because of Section 230 and largely these claims have been dismissed. So. You know, you're right that some sites in are aggressive with their terms of service and community guidelines, right? And it's disappointing, so I urge them on my book to be really clear about what they mean about like terms like offensive and they shouldn't say offensive speech. But if they did, be clear about what you mean about hate speech, for example, which is totally protected speech, and allow for some modes of due process, right? Not just yanking people offline, but in a way, that isn't that how the First Amendment operates? That is, when you walk into a private diner or a restaurant. If you start screaming at the top of your lungs, obscenities at the waitress, you know, they can walk you out, right? Isn't that how we develop sort of social norms? And we're going to have some over and under curation. And in a way, that's what, how we want this marketplace to sort itself out. I guess I see too much of the, we have Section 230, and we can let it all hang out and fly in our blog. I don't care if it's the same view. There's a privacy invasion or a threat. Too bad, so sad. And victims find that they can't get jobs. They're undateable, unemployable, right? Uh, I could have seen less of that in the world in which I write about. But it's the heckler's veto. Shoot, there's no veto. Like they don't care what the heckler says. They right? It's just it's there for everyone to see. Uh, actually, I've seen victims of attack by complaint. In other words, people have been shut down because they because you know uh, Twitter. And yeah, like an abuse you know, especially abuse especially when right. you're talking about yeah. like secular bloggers yeah. will get and shut down yeah. when uh, re religious fundamentalists, and oh, particularly yeah. in the Muslim world, yeah. complain of blasphemy. Yeah. And so you find that voices don't get heard as a result. Yeah. There's a question in New York. Yes. Uh, I, I share Laura's. It's Victor Kovner. Davis right. I share Laura's uh, concern about criminalizing speech, but I was curious um, why no one has identified what I think is the prime remedy, which is a civil remedy, and it's the tort, which many of these, these tables have gotten dismissed in other contexts with now difficulty, namely intentional infliction of emotional distress. It seems to me cyberbullying, which uh, it can cover a number of the instances that Daniel led at the outset with is uh, it rather um, should be rather simple to prove an intentional infliction civil claim. Now some say why why bother with it? Uh, first of all you, you don't have to depend on the police who have a lot on their plate. It's uh, one can do it privately and uh, it brings to mind that uh, our firm about 15 years ago, along with Paul Weiss, brought the, uh, the suit on behalf of Planned Parenthood on the West Coast against those who posted the Nuremberg files online. The Nuremberg files, you recall, were the photographs of those medical professionals who participated in abortion. And as some were assassinated, X's came across their, uh, their, their photos. We won that uh, claim against a fierce a First Amendment objection, sustained substantial judgments. Of course, the people who put those files up, uh, not surprisingly, were not people with substantial assets. However, their wages were garnished for years thereafter. I can't think of a more satisfying, long-lasting lesson uh, than the garnishment of wages, and I don't want to leave the Planned Parenthood subjects without drawing people's attention to the recent uh, development, not in Texas, which has gotten the most attention, where the, the perpetrators of those um, uh, 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 altered uh, uh, footage involving 
discussions of fetal tissue were um, uh, charges against them were dismissed and brought in Texas. I think it will fail uh, uh, criminal charges. But in California, there's a massive complaint uh, against them with a whole series of torts asserted, not all of which would apply to the kind of intentional affliction, but some are in there. I would watch that case because those people who did that may not be headed for jail in Texas, but they're headed for bankruptcy or or years of having their wages garnished. So it seems to me we have existing civil remedies which uh, ought to be examined very carefully. And can you get law firms to do it? Well, there are a lot of- I lovingly talk about intentional uh, <laughs> of emotional distress, public disclosure, private fact defamation. No, I, I believe me in my book, we, I didn't get to give my whole spiel about uh, the book I wanted to spare all of you, but though I talk about, of course, tort remedies, criminal, as well as civil rights law, ways in which we can use all of these remedies. The, the problem that victims often have, though, is, of course, how expensive it is to sue. Um, and lawyers often won't take these cases on contingency because, as you aptly know, there really isn't a deep pocket given Section 230. So, but we have groups like the Cyber Civil Rights Legal Initiative, which is uh, Tannel Gates, is now taking pro bono uh, cases involving cyber harassment. Like within a week of announcing that they had this legal initiative, they had 100 cases. So they had to like close up the pro bono effort, right? They could only take 100 cases. But I hope that everyone in this room, practicing lawyers, would consider taking pro bono civil matters because I think you're exactly right. Um, that if we could get civil remedies against someone, even if they don't have a deep pocket, but they have to think about it, right? Garnishing their wages strikes me as would be so incredibly satisfying to all the victims that I write about in my book. So absolutely, I'm totally with you um, and, and sort of explore the, their First Amendment implications in the book as well. Well, to say the uh, cyberbullying that I mentioned is the subject of the $17 million libel verdict. Um, so, uh, you know, and as Victor knows, you need the kind of outrageous conduct that, you know, is a very high bar for intentional affliction for a good reason. Um, there's not necessarily falsity involved. Um, and uh, I, I think, and another question that you raise in your book is should there be Jane Doe, John Doe uh, lawsuits available? Um, and for those who don't want to put their name out again and maybe face even more um, bullying. Um, and I think in those cases, there should be Jane Doe's. Obviously, there will be, uh, the, the defendant will at some point in time know who it is and be able to defend them, and that's part of the risk. But I think at least initially, they should be able to bring Jane Doe's cases. You got it. Um, so I, I'm interested, you started off the conversation talking about, um, you know, the, the blogger who's been attacked by, you know, these kind of broad-based attacks, and I think we've kind of moved to talking about an identifiable harasser, which I think the law is much more suited to dealing with, whether it's from an IAD tort claim, whether it's from copyright. What do you propose of, when you have this kind of the mob of the internet, where there's not there's not a person, there's there's a distributed swarm of sock puppets. It could be one person, it could be ten thousand people, and you just you don't even have a defendant. Like what what would be the remedy there without over over criminalizing, but also you know shutting down these very important forms of free speech for everybody, you know because you have these bad actors. And and the sort of cyber mob is what motivated the project itself. Yeah. Right, that is, whether it was a tax on female law students on a site like Auto Admit, yeah. or it was Kathy Sierra, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Those kind of anonymous cyber mobs, and the way in which it's the totality, mm -hmm. but each individual actor likely isn't responsible criminally, nor are they possibly, they're probably not for IIED. You need to sort of sustain outrageous behavior by a single person mm -hmm. when it may be that death by a thousand cuts, right? Those are the hardest and most complicated. You see it in Gamergate with Anita Sarkeesian where it's like thousands of people going after Brianna Wu and Anita Sarkeesian, all these women who, you know, 
create video games, right? Mm -hmm. All because they dare to talk about sexism in video games, right? They face death and rape threats and doxing and plotting and it's really hard to get at the crowd. Almost as Anita Sarkeesian explained to me, and it's in the book, she's like, what do I do? What do I say to law enforcement? It's thousands of people. Right. Am I really expecting them, right? And that's where I think law really breaks down. It's too blunt an instrument. And that's where I think the private actor is curating, as well as you were saying, like using their ability and freedom to curate, I think is where we're going to have the sort of the most targeted sort of response because those Swarms are laws way to to toughen an instrument. It just isn't. It's not fine tuned enough. But then they use their fortune. I mean. Oh yeah, yeah. and they do, right? <laughs> right. Oh yeah, and Encyclopedia Dramatic and all the right, right. fun trolls of the universe. They have subreddits and right. Um. Fortune is the one that published the celebrity news. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And those are top questions. To me, the the really fascinating legal issue about all of this is it, it forces you to determine, as Julie was saying earlier, why are why is this particular speech versus that particular speech not protected by the First Amendment or protected by the First Amendment? Going to the intentional infliction thing, is it merely the, the Snyder versus Phelps test? I mean, is there this you know very kind of Speaker-friendly definition of what the matter of public concern, and if it satisfies that test, Katie bar the door. All you know, there, there, there is, there is a First Amendment right to do this, or is there something about the medium that would would make you want to identify a category of unprotected speech that covers this, but wouldn't cover it? Because in another medium, because it somehow relates to a matter of public concern, and how do you deal with all of that in the context of a Supreme Court that's pretty much indicated we're not in the business of creating new categories of unprotected speech? And when you get out of areas that are relatively simple, like threats, how do you, how do you fit these things into a, an existing category without? Screwing up the category as it currently exists, or is there any realistic prospect of creating new categories? And if we can't do either of those things, are we comfortable saying we've got to tolerate a certain amount of this to keep our general regime of free expression the way we want it to be? And I think I sort of came down with a very conservative, careful, hewing very carefully to what the categories we have and and speech that historically has not enjoyed, has enjoyed less rigorous protection for the very reason that it's true that network technologies tend to spread far and wide, it's sort of like wildfire, really destructive information, the same with really positive stuff, right? So that it's true that the medium itself has an exacerbating effect, right? Because it's searchable, it's consistent, you know, it's, it's the first thing you see in a Google search of many victims' names, right? It makes it really difficult if you have to put in a cover letter that you're a victim of this abuse and that you didn't really post the new photo of yourself, right? Or sort of generate this, have a reason for it, the will lie that you have, no, I don't really have herpes, no, I really, I'm not a prostitute, right? But those same things that can make the abuse so spread like wildfire and be so, had such a powerful impact on people's lives are also the domestic, you know, you think of all the speech that's there for all the great reasons, but I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to suggest new categories or Think of the medium as something exceptional because there's also the really positive exceptional things about it. Um, I guess I'm saying what you probably all would, of course, say yourself. But I think I was reluctant for that reason to suggest that we depart from a very conservative approach that um, I didn't want to create new categories for the internet, so to speak, because what's next is not the internet, but something new and even more embedded in our lives. The internet of things or the security of things is we're going to have troubles along so many different dimensions. I think one thing you do see courts doing, is, and, and this is another thing I think would be good, is sort of educating the public on how to read what they see on the internet. I mean, I'm thinking about if an employer, you know, Googles me and sees what is up there and says, oh, I'm not going to hire her because of that, I don't want to be employed by those people. And we need to educate uh, the readers, and the courts have said, 
you know, people understand, you know, what's on the internet is not necessarily the same as what's in, you know, print newspaper where they work for, you know, hours and days versus a tweet that is wrong and, you know, links to the story, but it itself might be a mistake. And there's kind of reading all this in context. Um, and I think, you know, educating the public and employers and students how to read that, what they see on the internet in context is a big part of the process. And courses as well. And educating clients. I don't think employers actually have an interview many for the book. They don't actually believe that, you know, the lies and the privacy of agents, right? It's just that they hesitate to hire someone because they don't, A, want the person who comes with the habit. So they're distracted by dealing with harassment and stalking. And they don't want their clients to think they hire someone who is disreputable, right? So I don't think they believe this stuff. It's just that. They're cautious in a world in which we have abundantly lots more people. We have more people, more less jobs than there are there are so many more people. You just you pick the person that doesn't have this kind of service to deal with. So it's kind of what? Sorry, service. Like <laughs> uh, Yiddish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like stress and right, sorry. <laughs> Can I just say one more thing? Sure. The, the other observation I want to offer and, and maybe get some comments on is the other tort that obviously has some applicability here, which is you mentioned the publication of private facts. And as you said, the Supreme Court has, you know, assiduously avoided ever saying whether or not the, the publication of private facts tort can exist, at least in the context of a world in which there's some uh, newsworthiness or public concern involved. Um, but I wonder at the end of the day, you know, you were talking a hypothetical about Ron, all of a sudden he's a public figure, so that um, the discussion that he had about private matters, um, you know, which you said would be protected speech. Um, I wonder if we're, if ultimately when the court does get there or when court, even lower courts start working this out, they don't go to a kind of um, European model where they balance the degree of the intrusiveness or the ugliness of the privacy invasion against the level of public concern and make kind of a proportionality judgment about which is more important on the facts of each case. Um, I, 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 I'm ashamed to admit it because I generally don't like the European approach, but I, I'm starting to warm to that notion as really the only way out of this box. I'm willing to... Go ahead. Well, to Lee's point about the publication for it, um, before the internet, there were a ton of cases on what is essentially non-consensual porn, where exes would distribute pictures. Of, of course, back in the old days, it was actual pictures on the internet. They would distribute pictures about a the exes. They would put it on windshields in the car, uh, yeah. um, or mail them to bosses, or things yeah. like that. I mean, there's tons of cases on this. This is not a new problem. And the courts have universally said that if you're like a regular person, not a, not Hulk Hogan, <laughs> Hulk Hogan, I'm with you on that. I want to ask about Hulk Hogan. But <laughs> if you're a regular person, this happens to you. The publication of private privacy tort, I'm sorry, publication of private facts tort applies because it's private information, sexual information and nudity is private, and it's not newsworthy because you yourself are not in the nexus of a, of a newsworthy matter. I don't understand why this is different. It should be the same analysis. And for some reason, everybody thinks, well, it's the internet, so it's different. And I don't see why the medium changes that analysis. But what's worse is that when advocates are trying to take the privacy tort and turn it into a criminal statute, they mess with it too much and make it, I think Laura's concerns about over-criminalizing are that when you try to turn it into a criminal statute, you have multiple problems. One is you need an intent requirement. And you could add an intent requirement without too much difficulty and maintain the integrity of, of it, and it would still work. Um, but the other problem is that you start running into all these other requirements that they want to put on it, that you have to have known the person, you have to have known of the expectation of privacy, or you have to have like, done all these other things, or they try to tie it to copyright, or they try to tie it to the number of people you've disseminated it to. And it seems like you lose the essence of what was meant by the tort when you try to get to fit a particular scenario, like a particular one of your anecdotes, and you take the tort and try to make it fit that anecdote, instead of letting it be what it is, which is facts that are private, which nudity is, 
And even though um, nudity alone is not an unprotected category, it doesn't mean it's always protected. I mean, the Supreme Court has said indecency is not protected if strict scrutiny, if you can meet the strict scrutiny test. And so if you have a compelling interest, which you do, and there's no other way to remedy it, which it may be true in this case, and you have the intent requirement, and it's not newsworthy, that's the statute. Why is, why, I don't, I don't understand why it's not so difficult. <laughs> it should be relatively straightforward. And why layer on an intensive with emotional distress like the California Urban Employment Statute? Um, and, or reasonable person, reasonable expectation of privacy, which is not you know, on the Fourth Amendment, can be difficult to stop that with that. Right. But the problem it is, is actually complicated. The interpretation right? has to hew to the newsworthiness standard as it's already been established. I mean, right. we, we don't, don't need just, to build it into the statute, you're saying, right? Yeah, we don't need it's, to prosecute everybody who draws naked pictures. It's, I mean, it's right. really a question of is it truly a private fact? And is it newsworthy with the interpretation we've already had? Uh, the balancing just doesn't seem necessary to me. Um, I have a question here in New York. Um, I was at a public university a couple of months ago, and they asked me the following question that I would ask you guys, which is a um, parent comes to an administrator and says, my daughter, a student, has gotten a lot of social media, a lot of emails that's gone all over the school saying that she's a slut and worse. Uh, calling her all sorts of racist names and, wor and worse. Uh, my daughter has stopped going to classes, is very depressed, and I'm a fear is going to harm herself because she's so uh, shocked by all these, uh, all the social media about her. Um, the administration says, well, we went to our lawyer, and they say, well, we can't do anything because it doesn't appear that there's any incitement of imminent lawless action. Uh, there's no substantial disruption of education in the classroom. Um, and anyhow, the school maybe can't even get involved because none of this took place on campus. It's all written on computers in the students' homes. Uh, but yet, we don't want to do nothing because what if the student kills herself? Then we're going to look awfully bad from a uh, PR point of view. We're going to get sued for negligence. And by the way, we don't want students killing themselves. Um, what advice would you give that administrator? I feel like I've been asked that question by a administrator, right? And, and thankfully, inside of school. No, I guess so I'd say. Now, this is a public school. That's the whole point of the question. Public school, so it makes it more complicated, right? We know that courts are sort of. This is why we need to Right. <laughs> there was our Cato moment. <laughs> it had to come. Uh, we know that, you know, courts aren't clear in their message in lower courts about what what schools can do, right? Can you punish um, for speech uh, that occurs off campus and not the kind of disruption that we can sort of think of as disruption? Um, I think what I would urge people to do is have like sustained, uh, I've heard schools have sustained an ongoing conversation with students about, so rather than being an individual case and have punishment, but have an ongoing sort of long term devotion to the lessons of digital citizenship, to the harms of harassment and bullying, to have sort of community moments in which you talk to your students, not once and done, because that doesn't do very much, but have real ongoing sustained conversations with families, parents, and students, and that parents can't get off the hook and ignore what their kids are doing, but rather through education is how I've advised both private and public schools to address this. And I don't know. I'm looking at Lisa Zeigerman and my colleague who actually does a lot of school. So we need to. Like I sort of, but I, I feel barely like, talk to I mean, the scenario that, that you're setting up is one that I am, I'm imagining in a secondary school. I'm not imagining it at a public university. Do you advise right. universities to oh, sort of rally? Oh, I'm talking about um, secondary schools, yeah. like high schools. I mean, the, the, in, the, you know, the interruption to the educational environment and the special relationship that public secondary schools have with their student body is completely different in the public university setting. And I think that was George's voice I heard. The, 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 you know, the example that he's providing here is one where you, you have a school administrator who has absolutely no responsibility for off-campus speech and has limitations under the First Amendment as to what punishments or limitations they can put on student speech that occurs on campus. Um, or threats made on campus unless there's actual threat of bodily harm. 
And so, yes, you can have ongoing education and discussions, but what parents are you bring? You can't bring parents in, right? And it's, it's really about these adult students and how they conduct themselves. And this reminds me of um, Yik Yak and other social media uh, platforms that are on public university campuses yeah. where students anonymously or non-anonymously can post comments that many have viewed to be threatening, gang you know, sort of that mob mentality writ large in a social media platform, and is that the university's responsibility to moderate, um, or Yik Yaks or otherwise, and disclosure, we do counsel for Yik Yaks, so yeah. it's, it's, um, it's a very complicated, weedy area. Well, what's interesting, you know, thinking about Yik Yak, Colgate University, it's a private university, but I think it's sort of great, I have private kids going there in the fall, <laughs> so like, I'm biased, but it's had a great response um, to uh, sort of, it was really hasty on campus about a year and a half ago, but, but faculty went on Yik Yak and voted down really destructive speech, got involved in the conversation on Yik Yak, became part of the kind of solution to make students feel safer. Now, they didn't do a perfect job, as you'll admit, but, you know, I think that, that they're, they're, we're in a tough spot, too, even though as a private, I imagine as a private university, they could have done whatever they wanted, right? But but I think they chose to be part of the sort of making students feel safer by part of voting down some of that speech. Yeah. That would be a great I, I, I like but not all public university professors feel safe in their own job security yeah. to put themselves yeah. forward in a very personal way. Like yeah. that. Comment from New York? Yes, I, I did want to try to respond to George's question with the question one. If, if the student were in, a, if we're talking about secondary students in a private school, there's no question that they would face discipline and expulsion after warning. If there were a charter in a charter school in the city of New York, that would also happen. Uh, and only the children in public schools uh, appear to be the, without those same protections, which warrants, it seems to me, further review. Uh, although I think there are curricula devoted to uh, this very issue in which classes focus on it, spend time on it, which is, I think, the better way, but I don't know why public school children shouldn't. And I think even in public schools, if a child is disruptive in the New York City system, they may be applied, uh, transferred to a special school, and I don't know why that has to be limited to physical violence. I think it could apply to this kind of cyberbullying as well. And if it is, it will be reduced dramatically. Yeah, I think it's relevant for the context of uh, young adults doing this behavior, but also in response to you, why is the internet different? I think it really comes down to impulsivity. And with the young people, young people are impulsive. The court has recently held that for death penalty in the death penalty conference. But, you know, I think a balancing test is more appropriate in this area just because the impulsivity factor and the retweeting factor, single click ability, there's more uh, of a disconnect than printing out pictures and both putting on people's cards or sending it to a boss. So can I ask about Hulk Hogan? <laughs> <laughs> so we just talked about public versus private. We talked about you know all these different things. How is it that Hulk Hogan is going to apparently destroy a doctor now? And is this a good thing? The answer is he won't. Because yeah. the answer is it'll be reversed on a few. Um, Not just reduced, it'll be reversed. I believe it'll be reversed. Um, uh, there is a little fly in the ointment. Uh, I gather that they have to put up a bond of $50 million in order to take an appeal. But they can challenge, as I understand it, uh, they will be challenging whether they have to put up that 50 um, I don't know how successful that will be. Is, is the Hulk Hogan case different than the Aaron Andrews case? Um, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> if we're just going to leave it at the yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's I'm totally, gonna... totally different. I mean, the uh, Gawker didn't just receive the tape. This other guy, you know, the peeping Tom who, who and, you know, scoot around in the deep hole and uh, took the film himself. I mean, there's obvious difference. 
I mean, I read one article that shows that women still haven't made a mark because she only got 55 million and he got 140 million. I don't think that's a terribly cogent analysis. <laughs> She's more likely to get it. She's more likely, oh yeah, she's going to win. She, she'll have it to stay. I agree. I'm, uh, just for the, I'm doing an article for the uh, MLRC law letter that basically whose postulate is that uh, Hulk Hogan and Donald Trump are really the same person. So you can just <laughs> Whoa. Maybe Donald is somewhere in the I know. And Trump, Kerry Boea, or Hulk Hogan? I just wanted to um, make a comment. We've been talking a lot about categories of protected speech and unprotected speech, and uh, that's been the formula ever since Szaplinski, uh down mm -hmm. through. Um, a case that Paul successfully argued, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. Uh, and typically the court uh, lists from five to six, seven exceptions over the years. Uh, but when I counted them, I counted 43. <laughs> uh, now, it may be that some of those 43 could be lumped under the six, which might bring us down to 30 or even 25 or even 20. But suffice it to say that there are a lot of categories of, quote, unprotected speech that day in and day out are litigated that are not listed. And in fact, I think Szaplinski and the other opinions say, among others, but the emphasis uh, by talented lawyers like uh, our co my colleague here, Paul Smith, uh, you know, emphasized the six. And, and, but Practically speaking, that number is far greater, even if we say some of them are redundant and we bring it down to 20 or even 15. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 torts and criminal actions uh, that go on for prosecution day in and day out uh, beyond the six limited um, that the court has mentioned. I hope that doesn't get me thrown out of the salon, but uh, just uh, an explanation. So are we on the about All right. So in New York, unless you have any questions or comments, this is your final opportunity. If not, will you please read, read the book. It's very good. <laughs> I concur in that. Will you please uh, join with me in thanking Danielle Sisson? <laughs> and Lisa Carroll for doing a really good job. And Laura Hanley, likewise. And thank, uh, thank you all, and the next time we see you will be with Jeffrey Stone and Richard Posner live from Chicago. Thank you all. <laughs>